In this video, we are going to look at radioactivity. Some isotopes of atoms are unstable because they may have the wrong number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus or too much energy. Now, when we say the wrong number of protons and neutrons, we mean that the number of protons and neutrons does not balance. So this causes instability within the nucleus. These isotopes are called radioisotopes. To become more stable, then uh, they tend to lose some mass and energy. Remember, in my previous video on uh, atomic physics, I said that Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared, shows the interchangeability of energy and mass, i.e., Mass can be converted into energy and energy can be converted into mass. Delta E is equal to delta M times C squared. So to become more stable, they lose some mass in the energy. So this is governed by the equation. And they do so by emitting alpha particles, beta particles, gamma rays or other particles or radiation. This is called radioactive decay. And the particles and energy given out is called radiation. The atoms decay or change into atoms of different elements. For example, uranium breaks down to radon, which in turn breaks down into other elements. Radioactivity is the spontaneous, random emission of alpha, beta and gamma radiation and other particles from within the nucleus of the atom. So if we say, by definition, radioactivity is the random, spontaneous disintegration of an unstable nucleus to give a more stable one. Now, when we say a random, we mean that it is unpredictable as to which nucleus is going to decay next. We cannot predict the time when a single nucleus will decay next. Spontaneous means that the decay process occurs by itself and is not affected by physical conditions, e.g. temperature or pressure or chemical combination. Now let's look at background radiation. Background radiation is the radiation around us all the time, which is caused by radioactive materials in the rocks, in the air, and our bodies, as well as cosmic rays from outer space. In most areas, background radiation is safe because it is at a low level so that it doesn't harm anybody. Now, we're going to move straight into detection of radioactivity. There must be a way of detecting this radiation. And... Detection is done using detectors. Now, all the detectors of radiation or radioactivity use the ionizing ability of radiation. Ionization is the knocking out of electrons resulting in a positively charged ion. So, which means this radiation tends to knock out some electrons and then that results in uh, the ability to be detected using either for photographic films, gold leaf electroscope, the cloud chamber, or the Geiger Muller tube as well as the spark counter. Now we're going to start off with the photographic film. This is a diagram of a typical film badge. The badge contains layers of photographic film covered with black light proof paper. To reach the film, radiation must pass through a filter, so it's, it's labeled there, which absorbs some radiation or a transparent area through which radiation can pass easily, then it tends to change the photographic film or blacken the photographic film. So all the three types of radiation, they tend to blacken a photographic film. Now, next we have the gold leaf electroscope as shown there. Radioactive source, e.g. radium, which emits alpha particles, discharges a negatively charged electroscope because the air is ionized by the radiation and the positive ions discharge the leaf. If you remember how a gold leaf works, first of all it is charged negative, it's given a negative charge. So it means the top part of the electroscope which is outside the disc that you see there, that's what's used to charge it up. So it runs all the way down. And then the gold leaf is what you see at an angle there. So this is going to give it a negative charge because we've given the whole thing a negative charge. So the negative gold leaf and the stem going down, they tend to repair each other, and then there's going to be an angle that's going to be measured there. Now, when radiation is, is placed on this electroscope, or the electroscope is exposed to radiation, since it is ionized, that's positively charged ions would tend to discharge it because it becomes less negative. So you know the presence of this radiation by the change in the angle between the gold leaf and the piece of metal that goes down. I hope that makes sense. Next is 
the cloud chamber. So that's the cloud chamber. Now inside the cloud chamber, droplets of vapor form around the ions produced by the passage of radioactive particles. So their tracks can be seen. So let me just explain what you have said. We have the felt ring soaked in alcohol and the temperature is approximately room temperature, right? And then we have black metal base plate and then we do have a radioactive source that then comes. We're going to have a very cool temperature at the top and then high temperature there. And then since we've got dry ice, dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. When the radiation enters there, it's going to ionize the air that is right there and then streaks of these cloud is going to be seen as a result. That's what you're going to see there. So the alpha particle is in the form of streaks, as you see, thick streaks. And then beta source have become thinner. In other words, the ionizing ability of alpha particles is greater than that of beta. And then gamma rays, you just see very, very small uh, streaks, very, very small and disjointed, which means that there's less ionization that takes place uh, from gamma sources. So as compared to alpha sources, beta has less ionizing ability, then gamma is very little ionizing ability. So that is from cloud chamber. Now, next we are going to talk about the GM tube which is the Geiger-Muller tube. Now, a Geiger-Muller tube is a metal tube with a thin wire in the center containing a gas at low pressure. There is a high voltage between the tube and the wire. Radiation entering the tube creates positive ions and electrons, which move towards the case and wire. A voltage pulse forms when they reach it, which is amplified and passed to a scalar or a rate meter. A scalar counts the pulses and shows the total number, and the rate meter shows the rate in counts per second, e.g. 50 counts per second or 100 counts per second. A loudspeaker makes a tick when the radiation is detected. Right, let me explain once again. So the thin line that you see that is running in between the cylindrical part, so that is the anode. As you can see, it's connected to a 450 volt source. So that is our anode. And then the one that is going to the right and then all the way down through a rate meter, it's going to be our cathode. So that's the negative. Then we have a thin mica window on the extreme left. So this is where radiation enters. So the radiation enters through the mica window. When it does so, it's and then inside the tube, there is argon gas at low pressure. Okay, So this argon gas is going to be ionized by the radiation as it enters through the mica window. Then when this ionization takes place, there is going to be an electric field set up between the positive and the negative. That is, a complete circuit is formed and the rate meter then makes a count that the counts per second, that is of the radiation that has been received. Then next we have what is called a spark counter, that one's shown. Now the source ionizes the air, the ions cause sparks to form between the gauze and fine wire. The voltage between the gauze and wire is about 5 kilovolts. So as you can see, there's that metal goes shown in red, the X's that are shown in red. So this is connected to the negative in this, in this one here. And then there is a radioactive source. So when the radiation comes through to the wire goes, there's going to be ionizing of A. And then there's going to be complete circuit formed because of the ionized A molecules. So then that constitutes the spark counter. So sparks are going to be seen in the process. That's why it's called a spark counter. So it looks like this. So that's the wire goes that you can see there. Then we've got the source of radium. And then the sparks develop between the, the wire goes and the fine wire that you see there that's connected to a positive like that. Okay, so that is all about uh, uh, detectors. Now, next we are going to talk about why radiation is very harmful. Now, nuclear radiation is harmful because it is ionizing. So it can knock electrons out of atoms and damage molecules. Molecules in living cells can be damaged, so the cells die or cancers can form. Then we're going to talk about the three types of radiation, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. The penetrating abilities, first of all. Alpha particles are the least penetrating. As you can see, they are stopped by paper here, a thin sheet of paper, whereas beta particles pass through the paper and stop by 5 millimeters of aluminum. Then the gamma rays are not stopped by the 5 millimeters of aluminum, but can pass through only to be reduced in intensity by 
25 millimeters of lead. So gamma rays are never fully absorbed. They can only be reduced to half by a 25 millimeter piece of lead. We have already talked about the ionizing ability. We said that the most ionizing are the alpha particles and the least ionizing are the gamma rays. Then next we talk about deflection in an electric field. The effect of an electric field on natural radioactivity. If we do have the plates, they are positive at the top, negative at the bottom, and then we have a radiation source. Suppose this radiation source emits the three types of radiation, the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. Gamma rays will pass through straight and deflected because gamma rays are neutral. They do not have any charge. Beta particles are deviated towards or deflected towards the positive plate because they are negatively charged. Alpha particles being positively charged are deflected to the negative. I want you to notice the angle of deflection here for the beta particles. It is larger than the angle of deflection for alpha particles. So there's a smaller angle of deflection on alpha particles than on beta particles because beta particles are lighter. Beta particles are high energy electrons. So they are lighter. So they tend to be attracted to the positive plate with more force because of their light mass. Whereas alpha particles have mass. So they tend to be deflected slowly to the negative plates. Gamma rays are electromagnetic rays. So they do not have any charge. They are electromagnetic waves. They don't possess any charge. Alpha particles are the nucleus of a helium atom. So in the nucleus, remember the last video, I said the nucleus of every atom is positively charged. The charge in the nucleus is balanced by the charge of orbiting electrons. Now the nucleus of helium does not have any electrons, so it is positively charged. In summary, beta particles are deflected towards the positive plate because they are negatively charged. Alpha particles are deflected towards the negative plate because they are positively charged. And then gamma rays are undeflected because they are uncharged. Then we talk about deflection in a magnetic field. Suppose the direction of the magnetic field is into the page as shown by crosses. Remember crosses depict into the page and dots depict out of the page. So in this case we've got crosses. Now this is an alpha source. It's being deflected up. Gamma rays pass through and deflected in a magnetic field again because they do not have any charge. Remember a moving charge experiences a magnetic force. A stationary charge does not experience a magnetic force. It experiences a, an electric force. So the moment you have a charge that is moving in a magnetic field, then it experiences that magnetic force. Now the direction of the magnetic force that is experienced by these charges is given by Fleming's left hand rule. So if you hold your first finger pointing into the, the page that is shown by the X, and then we have the current. Remember the current is the second finger. Alpha particles are positively charged, so they would move in the same direction as current because conventional current is the move of positive charges so which means the thumb points upwards which means that alpha particles will be deflected upwards now to show beta particles if you remember in my topic on uh, magnetic fields electrons oppose the movement of current so you hold second finger pointing in opposite like from right to left whereas the magnetic field is into the page so the thumb will be uh, showing a downward uh, deflection of beta particles because they are negatively charged now we have the three here. Um, so if the magnetic field, this diagram here is wrong, they're supposed to be crosses and not dots because they're telling us here that the magnetic field is into the page. So if it's into the page, they must show by crosses and not dots. So as you can see, the extent of deflection of beta particles is larger than that of uh, alpha particles because beta particles have a small mass as compared to alpha particles. So the extent of deflection is larger. So whenever you're asked to draw this, please make sure that the angle here is greater than the angle on the alpha particle. Now let's look at this table that summarizes the properties of alpha, beta, and gamma. So the nature of an alpha particle is a helium nucleus. Okay, A helium nucleus is two protons and two neutrons. An alpha particle is positively charged. The nature of a beta particle is a high energy electron. So it is negatively charged. The nature of gamma rays is electromagnetic radiation, similar to X-rays, radio, microwaves, and so forth and so on. And so they are uncharged. The ionizing effect of alpha particles is very strong. Ionizing effect of beta particles is weak. 
and for gamma it is very weak. The penetrating ability of alpha particles is very minimal, not very penetrating. Store by thick sheet of paper or by skin. Beta particles are penetrating but stored by aluminium sheet, 1 cm thick and lead 3 mm thick. Whereas gamma rays are very penetrating, absorbed by lead several centimeters thick and concrete more than 1 meter thick. The range in air of alpha particles is only 5 cm in air. Of beta particles about a meter and then in gamma rays they go to infinity. Effects of fields. Alpha particles deflected by magnetic and electric fields. Beta particles deflected by magnetic and electric fields but no deflection on gamma. Then detectors. Alpha particles detected by photographic field, cloud chambers, Geiger tube, spark counter and gold leaf electroscope. Whereas beta particles can be detected by photographic film, cloud chambers and Geiger tube. In gamma, only photographic film, cloud chamber and Geiger tube as well. Right, so I think I'll, I need to end the video here. In the next video, I'll be talking about decay equations. Signing out.